This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. When investigative reporter Dan Casalero was found dead in a West Virginia hotel room, his wrists had been slashed 12 times and his confidential papers were missing. Local police ruled his death a suicide, but Casalero's family and friends are convinced he was murdered because he had accumulated compelling evidence of widespread government corruption. In Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a single mother and her daughter are found dead in their home. A neighbor, John Purvis, is convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. With the help of unsolved mysteries, Purvis is now a free man. And two other men are behind bars, awaiting trial on charges of first-degree murder. Also, the authorities need your help. They want to identify and capture a man who attacked an elderly couple while they were on vacation. Join me. Perhaps you hold a crucial clue that will solve one of tonight's unsolved mysteries. On what seemed like an ordinary Saturday afternoon in the summer of 1991, a housekeeper at the Sheraton Hotel opened room 517 for routine cleaning. Nothing could prepare her for what she found inside. Oh, God. Lying in a tub of bloody water was a guest registered to the room. Clearly, the man was dead. The housekeeper discovered the body of Danny Casalero, a 44-year-old investigative journalist from Fairfax, Virginia. Within minutes, Martinsburg police were called to investigate. In the room, they found a brief suicide note which read, to my loved ones, please forgive me, most especially my son, and be understanding. God will let me in. Hi, Tom. Lieutenant, what do you got here? Uh, seems pretty clear it's a suicide. We got a note here. Got about a dozen slash marks on the wrist. In the bathtub, police recovered a single razor blade. Incredibly, Casalero's wrists were slashed 12 times, with eight cuts on his left wrist and four on his right. One cut was deep enough to sever a tendon. The reporter's wallet was found in his room with cash and credit cards intact. There appeared to be no evidence of a struggle. Why don't you uh, wrap it up here as quickly as you can, and we'll get out of here. Good job. You got it. Casalera's body was delivered to a Martinsburg funeral home later Saturday afternoon. However, two days passed before Casalera's family was notified of his death. My mother called me, and you know, uh, she said, uh, Danny's dead, they've killed him. And I called the police at that point. She didn't really know any details and spoke with the sergeant doing the investigation. Hi, this is Dr. Tony Casalero. I'm calling about Danny Casalero. Yes, I just spoke with the father. How can I help you? Yes. What happened? And he said, we found your brother and he committed suicide. Suicide. The hotel maid found his body when she went in to clean his room on Saturday around 1 o'clock. Uh, Saturday? This is Monday. I asked them why it had taken them two days to notify us, and he, he at the moment didn't know. He just said he thought we had already been notified. Uh, sir, no. Uh, look, what do you know about my brother? I started asking him questions. What about all the papers he had with him, the investigation he was doing, and the, and the sergeant was clearly, really didn't have any idea about this. And 
at that point told me they found no papers in his room. The papers Casalero had with him in Martinsburg included hundreds of notes and documents for more than a year of investigation. Not one has ever been found. From the moment we heard about his reported suicide, we uh, doubted it, questioned it, wondered about it. It was not his nature to kill himself. So we were suspicious from the first. And then the deeper we dug into it, the more suspicious we became. Suspicious circumstances uh, surrounding the investigation of his alleged suicide. Danny Casalero's fear of blood tests and other minor medical procedures was well known to his family. They found it incomprehensible that he committed suicide by slashing his wrists a dozen times. Just days before his death, Danny Casalero enthusiastically told friends he was close to breaking the story that had consumed him the past year. It had started as an inquiry into computer software theft, but soon mushroomed into a broad investigation of government corruption that Casalero believed implicated U.S. Justice Department officials. Many suspect that Casalero was silenced because he had found out too much. Danny Casalero's strange odyssey began when he interviewed Bill and Nancy Hamilton, the owners of a computer software company called Inslaw. First of all, when was the Promise software developed and what was it for? Well, there's a big need for this kind of software. The Hamiltons had developed a powerful program called Promise that they claimed revolutionized information management by law enforcement agencies. In 1980, the U.S. Justice Department purchased the Inslaw software to handle their millions of case files. Initially, the program earned high praise and handsome returns for Inslaw. Then the climate of justice suddenly changed. What we'll do first is bring up a menu. At the beginning of the second year of the three-year contract, the Justice Department began to withhold payments from Inslaw. And they uh, withheld a couple of million dollars from Inslaw drove Inslaw into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The Hamiltons then discovered that the Canadian government had acquired their software, despite the fact that Inslaw had never sold the program to Canada. What sort of funny things started happening? The Hamiltons told Casalero that they were mystified by illegal sales of their software until they spoke to a man named Michael Riconosciuto. He claimed to have worked for the CIA on numerous top secret projects. Rick Conosciuto agreed to talk to unsolved mysteries about the unauthorized use of Inslaw software by clandestine agencies. Well, the parties that were involved in the uh, distribution of this software uh, were involved in covert operations, and they were involved in uh, uh, Nicaragua and Central America, and they were involved in uh, operations in the Middle East. And uh, yes, I have direct knowledge of uh, funds uh, from the sale of uh, this product uh, being used uh, to finance those operations. As early as August of 1989, the brewing Inslaw scandal had drawn the attention of Congress, and the House Judiciary Committee opened a formal inquest. The report describes the committee's investigation into serious allegations that high-level Department of Justice officials were involved in a criminal conspiracy to force Inslaw, a small computer company, out of business. Michael Riconosciuto began telling his story to committee investigators. Within a week of submitting his sworn affidavit to the committee, Riconosciuto was arrested on drug charges by agents of the Justice Department. He is currently being held in federal custody in Chicago, Illinois. While the drug conviction taints Reconosciuto's credibility, the committee also heard from a witness with impeccable credentials, Elliot Richardson. Now legal counsel for the Hamiltons, Richardson was attorney general under Richard Nixon. In 1973, Richardson had resigned rather than participate in the Watergate cover-up. There is simply too much to be ignored. In the case of Inslaw, there's a a spreading radius of circumstantial evidence which at its outer reaches entails a, a far more sinister kind of conspiracy than anything revealed in Watergate. Do you have any information as to whether or not they acquired the promised software? After months of investigation, 
Castellera believed he had uncovered an unsavory network of U.S. officials, organized crime members, and intelligence agents. He called it the octopus. Is system, or is that being used by their intelligence operations? Casalero claimed the octopus was at the root of not only the Inslaw affair, but the Iran-Contra scandal, BCCI, BNL, and even the now largely discredited October Surprise. In short, just about every major scandal of the 1980s. After direct connections with some of the underworld crime figures... The deeper Casalero went in search of the octopus, the more he found himself on intimate terms with shadowy characters. Danny Casalero stepped into a world that he didn't belong in. Uh, the type of people that he became involved with um, lie just as a matter of, of course. Uh, I think after a while, some don't even know what the real truth is. Uh, they lie, they cheat. There are people who have been involved in numerous murders, dealing drugs, dealing arms. And Danny Casalero thought he could find his way through this labyrinth by himself. And that was a mistake. Are you serious? I don't know. I don't think so. A week before he died, Casalera told his brother he had been receiving frequent death threats. Who are these guys? Well, I don't know. I mean, I know a couple of them. They're the guys that I've been working with, my contacts. And they're calling me and saying, look, Danny, you're getting too close. You're going to get hurt. Back off. And I'm getting calls in the middle of the night from guys I've never heard of. I don't recognize their voices. I don't know where they're coming from. They're just saying, you are going to die. <laughs> I'll tell you this, though. If, when I go to Martinsburg, if something happens to me or if I should get hurt, don't believe it's an accident. With briefcases full of notes and documents, Casalero arrived in Martinsburg to meet with several informants and conclude his investigation. He had been tracking the finances of the octopus and believed one of his new contacts would deliver key evidence. Danny had a source there inside the IRS's uh, computer data center that was giving him uh, hard copy printouts of uh, uh, IRS information on certain specific targets that Danny was after. William Turner? And you are? Danny Casalero? Get in. The day before he died, Casalero met with another source, William Turner, a former employee of a major defense contractor. You have some documentation? You have some for me? driver's license. According to Turner, he handed over paperwork documenting corruption that Casalera believed was tied to the octopus. Housekeeping. Within 24 hours, Casalera would be found dead, and Turner's documents would disappear along with the rest of Casalera's papers. In response to the controversy surrounding Casalera's death, Authorities in West Virginia convened a formal inquest, including a complete autopsy. The assistant medical examiner for the state of West Virginia, he said, well, you know, um, he's already been embalmed, and that's going to make it a little difficult. And I said, what are you talking about? He's already been embalmed. And he said, well, he was embalmed uh, apparently already. He said, you didn't know that? I said, absolutely not. I said. We didn't give any permission. I said, is that how it's, what's supposed to happen? He said, no, that's not. He said, but we'll just have to look into that. I'm now going to cut the sutures to examine the wounds. The autopsy confirmed that bleeding from the 12 razor cuts had resulted in Danny Casalero's death. More importantly, the autopsy disclosed evidence suggesting Casalero may not have been alone in the hotel room during the final moments of his life. Six cuts on the flexor surface of the left wrist I was told there were no signs of any struggle. There was, on the actual autopsy report, described a bruise on the arm and a bruise on the head, which were never accounted for. Uh, additionally, the tips of three fingernails were missing from one hand. You know, the other things, the embalming, the whatever, you think, well, you know, things can happen and just accept things. But this, they did not tell us the truth. He had bruises on him. Casalero's hotel room had been cleaned the day after his death by a professional cleaning crew, and the workers inadvertently discarded important evidence. The previous day, minutes after Casalero's body had been found, 
one of the Sheraton housekeepers noticed two bloody towels in the bathroom. They appeared to have been used to wipe blood off the bathroom floor. The question of who tried to clean up the floor with the towels has never been addressed by West Virginia authorities. The police reports of the investigation are certainly not professional. Fingerprints get lost, messed up. They drain the tub without a strainer. Sloppy work. What were the towels doing underneath the sink? The police did not check them. Police have a rule in this country, and government people have a rule. When they screw up, they cover up. Sad but true. Do I think they covered up here? Yes, I do. There is enough evidence that he was murdered so that there should have been a much more intensive investigation than there has been. I don't know enough to know for sure, but all that I do know makes me believe that it was more likely that he was murdered than that he committed suicide. Our brother Danny Casolaro has gone to his rest in the peace of Christ with faith and hope in eternal life. Even Casolaro's funeral was clouded by mystery. As a ceremony was drawing to a close, a highly decorated military officer arrived in a limousine. It was really unusual because I noticed this tall, stoic-looking black man in full military dress standing there with this, like, plain clothes type of guy. Just before the casket was lowered into the ground, the military man carefully placed a medal on the casket lid. And we went back to Francis's house, Danny's mother's house, and I said, Francis, who was, who was the, the military man? And she said, I thought you'd know. Don't you know that guy? And I said, no. And we asked everyone there. There had to be 50 people at Francis' house. No one knew who they were. No one. The official inquiry into Casalero's death was concluded more than a year ago. However, Casalero's clothing, wallet, suicide note, and other personal items have been retained with no explanation by the investigators. Meet the O'Neill children of Southern California, six happy, well-adjusted adults. To look at them, you would never guess that their early years were racked by trauma. In 1958, the untimely death of their father, Paul O'Neill, precipitated the first in a series of family secrets that would haunt the children for years. Within every family that harbors deep secrets, it seems there was someone determined to uncover the truth. The O'Neills are no different. For Bill, the youngest son, this quest would lead him through a tangled web of intrigue, woven out of desperation by his mother. Eventually, Bill would unravel the mysteries of his family's past and begin a remarkable search, first for the sister he thought was lost forever, and now for his natural father. Bill O'Neill's personal odyssey began in adolescence. Throughout his childhood, he was plagued by a nagging, inexplicable loneliness. I was pretty to myself as a kid. I mean, I didn't have like a great deal of friends or anything like that. Pretty much just sat in front of the TV a lot of the time. I was told from the earliest that I can remember that Hugh O'Neill was my father and I was the last child born by him before he passed away. I felt it inside, though, about feeling a little bit different, uh, you know, with the other kids growing up. I, like, I was the only one with hazel eyes, and everybody else had these bright blue eyes. My skin was more like an olive skin, where they were fairer skinned. Not that anything was ever said to me or anything like that that was different than anybody else. Like, my mom didn't treat me any different. Uh, just a feeling inside, like something was lost. Years passed. The O'Neill children grew up and started their own families. In 1983, Bill's older brother, Tim, 
journeyed to Chicago with his wife and child to visit his father's gravesite for the first time. Hugh, that's his middle name, but Mom always called him Paul. When I got there, we found that the date of uh, death on my father was uh, December 20th of 1958, which made it impossible for um, Bill to be one of his children. Tim was bewildered by the indisputable fact that his father had died two full years before his brother Bill was born. When he returned to California, Tim went to see the only person who could sort out the baffling discrepancy. I went to my mother's house, and um, she had told me that uh, she didn't want Bill to know about this or anybody else in the family to know about it, and that um, sh she would basically take it to her grave. She didn't want anybody in the family to know about the dates and what had transpired years ago. Against his better judgment, Tim respected his mother's wishes and kept her secret to himself. What's up? Nothing else in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd drop by. But by 1986, Tim had decided yeah. to tell his brother the truth. Did she ever ask about he was stunned to discover that Bill Nothing had always really. suspected. Whatever happened with you and Mom anyway? I mean, I can't even mention your name without her getting upset. Yeah, well, that's because you don't know about the O'Neill secret. What are you talking about? It's nothing. No, tell me. You ask her. No, I'm asking you. I knew what he was going to say. I had the feeling already inside. Is it that I have a different father than you guys? Yeah. Just had a feeling. I felt like all, all the years that I had been feeling the way I felt was sort of just all confirmed. And now where do I go from here? I remember just going into sort of like a shock mode, though. You know, I'm feeling real empty. Later on that night when I confronted my mother, uh, she, uh, she didn't deny it or anything like that. She asked me how I had found out, uh, but she did not deny it. And uh, it, it went real well. I mean, I didn't have any kind of animosities towards her at all. Bill's mother told him that she had met Paul O'Neill in 1953. He was 29, she was only 20. It was love at first sight, and by the next summer, they were married. Over the next four years, Paul and Lynn had three children and bought a house on Chicago's south side. Their happiness, however, would not last. Paul O'Neill was a World War II veteran and suffered from a chronic kidney ailment. By November of 1958, Lynn was eight months pregnant with her fourth child, and Paul was spending most of his time in Chicago's VA hospital. Hi, honey. Hi. Telephone, please, Dr. Klein. How are you doing? Oh, uh, getting by. On one visit, Hi. Lynn O'Neill met another veteran named Jim Burke, who was a good friend of Paul's. Hey, Jim. So this must be the beautiful lady you've been keeping yeah. from me. <laughs> Sadly, within a month, Paul O'Neill would die. Nice meeting you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much about you. Whoa! Oh, oh that was terrific. It wasn't long before Jim Burke became a familiar presence in the O'Neill household. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, come on in. Door's open. I remember that there was a man that was that was around our house, and he had dark, kind of wavy hair, and he had dark eyes but I don't put a name with him. I don't know what his name is, but I'm comfortable with that this man is, is there. During the summer of 1959, Jim Burke moved to Southern California. Lynn and her children soon followed. A year later, in September of 1960, Lynn gave birth to Bill. The next year, Lynn became pregnant again but her relationship with Jim Burke had begun to deteriorate. By the time the child, a daughter named Peggy, was born, Jim was completely out of the picture. I believe that they didn't get along well, and they didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, and it was a rough time. But to my knowledge, Jim didn't leave just because he wanted to leave. He left because they mutually decided that they should separate. Maureen, will you watch your brothers, please? 
Lynn struggled to support all six children by herself. Compounding the difficulties were Peggy's health problems. She suffered from an ailment called failure to thrive and was in constant need of medical attention. When Peggy was 11 months old, Lynn told the other children that she was sending her to the hospital, but Peggy would never come home. All of a sudden, one day, she said she took her to the doctor and that they were going to keep her for a while to observe her or something like that, so we just all accepted it. And then later on, we were told that she had passed away. In 1990, Bill's mother, Lynn, revealed another shocking family secret. Her youngest daughter, Peggy, had not died. She had been given away. I need to talk to you, Bill. I need to tell you something. Sure. What is it? Remember us talking about your little baby sister, Peggy? At Peggy's request, her adoptive parents had contacted Lynn, who now felt compelled to tell Bill the entire story. Why? Well, she's alive, and she wants to meet you. She laid this, this sort of bombshell on me that night, and the only thing that went through my head was, boy, I want to go and meet her. You know, I felt, I felt good inside. Peggy had been adopted by Jerry and Richard Colvin of Silmar, California. They named her Karen and raised her in a stable and loving home. I got her adoptive parent's phone number from my mom because I wanted to find out, like, you know, what was she like? What did she do growing up? Different things like that, because I wanted to, because we, we had already set up a meeting to meet like a week and a half or so later, but I couldn't wait till then. With mounting anticipation, Bill called Peggy's parents. He never expected his sister to answer the phone. Hello? I was calling her parents just to talk to her parents and get a little insight on her. So when she answered the phone and told me, hi, this is Karen, your, your sister, I just went, uh, <laughs> I'm not ready for you. I'm not ready to talk to you. I don't know what to say to you. That's exactly what I said to her. I think it was. I don't know. <clears throat> I just finally put a voice to a person. You know, I finally made the connection that this person really does exist. Yeah, there's Santa. There's Santa Claus. Yeah. And there I am as a little skinny squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> In the three years since Bill and Karen were reunited, they have become yeah. as close as any brother and sister. In fact, the entire O'Neill family has welcomed Karen with open arms. But now she and Bill have set their sights on one final goal, finding their natural father, Jim Burke. It just seems like a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that needs to be put into place. I mean, now as a mother, I can't imagine being a parent and not knowing where my child is. I don't want to, you know, get into his life to, to tear it apart or anything like that. Uh, I just, I'd like to, to know him or meet him or anything and, and uh, you know, to, to have him know that, uh, that uh, I'm okay and Karen's okay. On the night of our broadcast, a woman named Eileen Essler of New Lenox, Illinois, called our phone center and identified herself as one of Jim Burke's four children from his previous marriage. Bill and Karen were saddened to hear that their father had passed away in 1988, but they were overjoyed that Eileen and another half-sister, Sheila Ann Haskins, were anxious to meet them. A week later, Bill O'Neill, Karen Althouse, and their families gathered at Karen's house to await the arrival of Eileen and Sheila Ann. I felt a connection, a definite connection, like when I reached out to hug them. I, d I don't know. I didn't, I honestly, to be honest, I just, <laughs> I didn't feel like I was going to be as emotionally tied as I felt. Ditto. For Sheila Ann and Eileen, the bond was just as strong. As soon as I saw Bill, 
As soon as I saw his face, there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that he was a brother. No doubt. I felt wonderful. I mean, I, like Sheila, I wanted to touch him. I just wanted to touch him to have a uh, baby brother and baby sister. I know they're not. They're so much taller than I... we are. <laughs> Later that afternoon, Bill and Karen sat down with her new sisters to learn about their father, Jim Burke. And, and how was it related to her? This is what I've wondered all my life. Who are my parents? Do I have more family? Did I have brothers and sisters? Things like that. And it's exciting to finally see them, to touch them, to, to get to know them. The reunion was especially poignant for Bill O'Neill. His lifelong feelings of isolation were replaced with a new sense of belonging. I just, I figured, hey, we'll get together with them and we'll be <laughs> make like nice. Me and <laughs> yeah, be, yeah, you know, get some pictures, get some more information about our dad. But it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. It was more. Um, <laughs> It was just an uh, inside warm feeling uh, that everything was now completed. That's true. Oh, God. Oh, Trade you here. <laughs> For Bill, Karen, Eileen, and Sheila Ann, this was just the first of many gatherings to come. Bill and Karen have since met one of their half brothers, and next March they hope to meet another at a family wedding in Illinois. Also in attendance will be a grandmother, an aunt, and 12 cousins. When we return, a cold-blooded killer strikes at a scenic rest stop in the Canadian wilderness. This police videotape was shot in Ontario, Canada, 13 hours after a brutal double murder. The place, the Blind River rest stop, just 85 miles from the U.S.-Canadian border on Highway 17. We were looking for a place to stop. So we saw this rest area. It was a nice, quiet river, ran along by this picnic area. We went out and we walked around and we thought, gee, we, it's, it's a nice, quiet little spot. We'll, we'll maybe spend the night here. On the morning of June 28th, 1991, Gord and Jackie McAllister of Lindsay, Ontario, were the only two people in the Blind River rest stop. The McAllisters, on the first leg of a vacation trip, had decorated their new camper with family photographs to make it as homey as possible. This guy was still banging on the side of it and saying that he was a police officer and he wanted us to open the door. Okay. We should be all right here, huh? <coughs> oh my God! I'm gonna rob you and then I'm gonna kill you. Oh God. Get your Please. things, get them in the purse. Get your purse, you will. We'll give him the money. Please. <laughs> Do you want my ring? Anything that's valuable, put it in there. Please don't hurt us. We won't tell anybody. Be calm. It's all right. Pick it up. She fell, and I made a leap to get out. I, I rolled underneath the motorhome, and I noticed another car had driven in to the rest area. And this guy got out and was standing beside the car. And 
I was laying there just praying. I was just praying to God that he'd keep on running. And he did. As soon as he went by, I rolled back out and got up into our motorhome and drove out onto the highway. I knew I had to get out onto the highway to get some help. Gord knew that his wife was horribly wounded, but only as he stumbled to the road did he realize that he too had been shot. It was a race against time. Buddy, are you all right? You gotta help me. My wife and I have been shot. Can you use your CP and call for help, please? My radio's broke, but I'll get the next exit and call for help. Hurry, please. Help did come, but it was too late. Gord's wife, Jackie, was already dead. We would have been married 39 years in September of 91. I didn't care whether I lived or died. I honestly didn't care. I thought my life was over. You don't live that long with a person and then it's hard to carry on by yourself. The gunman's other victim, Brian Major, also died at the scene, less than half an hour's drive from his home. Brian Major was 29 years old. He left behind a wife and a young son. Five days after the murders, Ontario Papers published a police artist's drawing of the gunman based on Gord McAllister's description. Shortly thereafter, a witness came forward. The witness said that a few minutes after 1 a.m. on the night of the murders, a blue late model van peeled out of the Blind River rest area and headed straight toward his car. The van continued dead east toward Sudbury, Ontario. The witness uh, timing of what he saw and the account of Gord McAllister certainly leads me to believe that either that van was a suspect's uh, van or it was perhaps somebody uh, in the rest area that had seen something that they had left quickly. The witness had not seen whether the van had Canadian or U.S. license plates. Police checked out more than 3,500 blue vans on both sides of the border. Nothing. The fortunate uh, situation here is that we do have a survivor. Gord McAllister survived his wounds, and hopefully he can point out the killer someday. No, can you? Go on. After Gord looked through hundreds of mug shots to no avail, the police turned to a sophisticated new technology, hoping to improve on the original rough sketch of the killer. That's close. That's close. No. Okay. No. For five long hours, Gord painstakingly matched features from the computer's files against his indelible memories. Mm -mm. No. No. Slowly but inexorably, the face of his back. wife's killer emerged. I'll never forget his face. It wasn't a robbery gone bad. There was no resistance to this guy. He just simply was going to kill somebody for no reason. I thought he was going to come after me because I'm sure that he knows I'm the only one that can identify him. And I was under police protection for a long time. They were watching me pretty closely, and I thank them for that. But I'm at the point now, and then I was even at the point then where I didn't care if he came after me. Maybe if he killed me, then maybe he'd get caught this time. The murder of Jackie McAllister and Brian Major is believed to be approximately 30 years old, about 5 feet 10 inches tall with a slight build. He has long, stringy blonde hair and a receding hairline. 
Next, a man wrongfully accused of murder is set free, thanks in part to unsolved mysteries. You're about to see the story of a man who suffers from schizophrenia. Nearly a decade ago, he became the victim of the judicial system, unjustly accused of a heinous crime and imprisoned, while the real perpetrators walked the streets scot-free. On November 8, 1983, police in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, converged on the home of Susan Hamley. They were responding to a frantic call from one of Susan's friends, who said Susan had not answered her phone for days. Susan was 38 years old, divorced, and the mother of an 18-month-old daughter, Shane. Susan Hamley was found dead on her kitchen floor. She had been sexually molested, strangled with a telephone cord, and finally stabbed through the heart with a carving knife. Susan had been dead for several days, during which time a second, nearly unspeakable tragedy had occurred. Susan's daughter, Shane, had died from dehydration. Police recovered two crucial pieces of evidence at the scene, a bloody carving knife with no fingerprints on it and red human hair. Statement? What kind of statement? The next day, detectives canvassed Susan's neighborhood. Two doors away, they questioned 66-year-old Emma Jo Bartlett and her 42-year-old red-haired son, John Purvis. Well, I knew her a little bit. Oh, good. Would you like to come down to the station and give a statement? Well, if my mama can come with me. Would you come with me, mama? John's mother went with him to the station, but was not allowed in the interrogation room. The detectives who questioned John were unaware that he suffered from schizophrenia, a physical disease of the brain over which the patient has no control. Schizophrenics often cannot tell the difference between the real world and the delusions that plague them. Well, they asked me if I knew Susan, and I said I just barely knew the girl at all. Then my mother came up, and, and she busted in the door. And she said, you have no right to interrogate my son like this. She said, my son did not kill the girl. We don't know who killed the girl. Why aren't you out looking for the real victim, real killer and everything? That's what she told him when she busted in everything. You get your hand on him. If you've got something on him, lock him up. Well, we don't have anything on him. Well, then let him go. Come on, get out. Let him go. some questions go. for him. John's mother took him in tow and stormed out. But the police were determined to question John Purvis alone. Four weeks later, they got their chance. A psychiatrist, Dr. Joel Klass, was brought to the station to administer a personality test using TAT cards. These cards feature ambiguous drawings which require interpretation. One of the cards elicited a most unusual reaction. Yeah. There's nothing on there. There's, there's, there's nothing there. There's just people. Will I have to go to jail or can I, can I, can I go to a hospital? Uh, I remember even feeling intimidated because he uh, showed such a strong reaction. Do you, do you think I did it? And after saying several times, uh, do you think I did it? Do you think I did it? And I said, I don't know, because uh, I didn't want to use any leading comments. And he said, I killed her, I liked her, and then implied that she did not respond to him in a favorable way. Subsequently, Purvis also confessed to the police. Those detectives down there at the police department told me that, said, if you'll confess that you killed Susan, we'll let you go home. So I had to say something in order to get out of there. So I just said something. I just said I killed her. That was all. I had to make something up to him. At the trial, only the confession to Dr. Class was allowed into evidence. Even though that confession did not match the details of the crime, and even though John Purvis's hair did not match the hair found at the scene, he was convicted of murdering Susan Hamley and her daughter, Shane. For eight and a half years, John Purvis languished in prison. His appeals exhausted, his case apparently hopeless. In 1987, the new defense attorney was assigned to the case. Last spring, he contacted Unsolved Mysteries. We filmed John Purvis's story, and interest in the case was renewed. The Fort Lauderdale police reopened their investigation with stunning results. 
The new investigation focused on Susan Hamley's ex-husband, Paul, a wealthy real estate developer in Aspen, Colorado. At the time of the murder, Paul Hamley was in Aspen, suffering from a broken leg. Last summer, following up on a tip they had received in 1985, the Fort Lauderdale police came to believe John Purvis had not killed Susan Hamley. In return for immunity, a man named Robert Beckett confessed that he and an accomplice, Paul Serio, had been paid $14,000 to murder Susan. The man who hired them was Paul Hamley. His motive? To avoid paying nearly $180,000 in alimony. In January of 1993, Paul Hamley and Paul Serio were arrested. That same week, after nine years spent in prison for a crime he did not commit, John Purvis was released. I just feel good. I just feel good about it and everything. I just feel good. What do you say, Mom? Do you think I'll ever go home again? I said, sure, you're going to go home, Johnny, and I know you are. The excitement of this whole case was John Purvis being let out. That it's one of the most circumstantial cases we at Fort Lauderdale have ever probably had anybody convicted on it. I can't sit here and think of any other crime that a man was convicted on such circumstantial evidence. But the, the problem is, everybody believed it. You know, I can't blame anybody. It was just on a very, very unfortunate mistake. On February 24th, 1993, John Purvis was officially exonerated in a formal hearing. He is now back at home with his mother. Paul Hamley and Paul Serio have been charged with two counts of first-degree murder. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, for centuries, religious pilgrims have journeyed to Mexico City to offer prayer and thanks to Our Lady of Guadalupe, a remarkable depiction of the Virgin Mary imprinted on a piece of rough cactus cloth. Believers claim that the striking image is truly a miracle, created in 1531 when a vision of Mary appeared to a peasant named Juan Diego. Skeptics say that while Our Lady of Guadalupe is an impressive work of art, it is hardly miraculous. Join me next time for the celebration of the Easter season and other intriguing cases on another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.